Hi and welcome, this is Marcus Breen and you're watching Boston Media Theory. This is a show where we talk to people who are engaged in looking at and exploring and maybe mobilising around media, communication and cultural theory. And there are lots of ways of addressing the questions that emerge in both everyday life and also in the academy, but outside the academy, not least of which of course is through some of the disciplines. So media and communication and cultural studies have tended to be interdisciplinary, whereas some of the other fields are much more tied to disciplinary pursuits. And so today I'm very delighted to welcome Charles Derber, who's a sociologist who comes to us from the discipline of sociology. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you, Marcus. Thank Thanks you for, for having me. Here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Charles, or Charlie, is from the sociology department at Boston College, and you've been there for a while. A while. A while. And he has... We won't a, say how many years. Okay, <laughs> we, we won't, no. Uh, and we, I, I just want to list some of the books that uh, you've put together, Universalizing Resistance, Welcome to the Revolution, Moving Beyond Fear, and then there's uh, others, of course, uh, but then there's one you're about to uh, release, I think, called, um, what is it, Internationalism or Extinction? Which That's the one with Noam Chomsky, yeah. Putting it together with Noam Chomsky. And then another one that you're putting together with Seren uh, Moodlia, which is called Resistance or Extinction. Right. Is there a theme there? <laughs> uh, extinction. <laughs> we'll, we'll I hear, there. yeah, we'll, I hear a theme there. I hear a theme there. So, yeah, so Extinction, um, Chomsky, who I've worked with over the years, um, has become very focused on the theme of extinction. He did a a, a talk that we turned into a film called Internationalism or Extinction a couple of years ago. The film is just coming out. And what he's showing is that we're getting a kind of, we've moved into a period starting around 1945 where two fundamental um, threats that are unprecedented and larger and more scary than anything in history, mm -hmm. which is the threat of wiping out of all life on the planet, um, are coming you know, steaming at us from the point of view of climate change and from the point of view of nuclear war, wars with weapons of mass uh, destruction. So Chomsky in this film sort of traces historically, starting with the period right after World War II, where nuclear weapons became, people became aware after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, how destructive nuclear weapons were. And at the same time, actually, although this didn't become widely known till later, um, uh, anthropologists and um, environmentalists were being to understand the, the new age of the Anthropocene, which was the new period of what was called the sixth extinction, six times that the world has faced change in the environment and climate that would destroy most of the living species on the earth. So these converged right after World War II mm -hmm. in both the nuclear age and the age of the Anthropocene, or the age of, you know, catastrophic climate change. and. There's been um, really, I mean, when you face the reality that there's this kind of um, unprecedented threat to human survival, that the human race may be extinguished, and mm -hmm. not just the human race, but virtually all, in fact, various animal and plant species are being destroyed every day in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet we're in a sort of era of extinction, what I would call extinction denial, uh, you know, which is, um, it's kind of interesting, back in the 60s, I don't know if you recall this, there was a book called The Denial of Death, which was by a guy named Ernest Becker that was yeah. a very celebrated book. It was about how hard it was for individuals to confront the reality that they were going to die. Mm -hmm. And in this notion of extinction denial that I've been thinking about, hard as it is to think about one's own death, it seems almost impossible for people to collectively think about the collective death of all humans and of all civilization and all life. And so, in some sense, the greatest challenge we're facing today is whether we can both psychologically, culturally, and politically come to terms with the reality of this challenge and do something about it as rapidly as possible. Um, yeah. and I should say one of the things Chomsky mentions this in the film and in the book we're doing with him, that probably the most dangerous institution ever created on the face of the earth is the Republican Party of the United States. Not in some partisan way or any love of the Democrats, but simply arguing that the Republican Party has basically 
ruled in the name of extinction denial. I mean, you can't be a Republican mm. and talk about climate change. In his latest State of the Union, we're talking right after the State of the Union message yeah. by Trump, he never used the word climate change. This was right after both the UN and his own um, environmental and scientific agencies had emphasized the threat was growing much more rapidly than scientists had been anticipating. Not a word. And in fact, Trump has sent an executive order through the government which says that any person working for the government who says the words climate change right. will be fired summarily. And so Chomsky is saying, you know, it's sort of insane that we have in the United States a government that is in denial and propagating it's sort of an Orwellian, mm -hmm. be beyond anything or Orwell could have conceived, beyond, you know, where we're simply in denial about acknowledging and turning to mobilize full scale to confront this challenge because it's coming at us very, it very fast. One of the things you uh, just mentioned, Charlie, which I think we should uh, focus on is the relationship between the reality of, you know, the material and, and other realities associated with the climate and extinction, and then the way that information and knowledge is circulated. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the problem, if you were, were to sort of politicize it a little bit, would be that, that the Republican Party or conservatives or those who are just con convinced that, that life should go on as usual without any question, um, are more than happy to use the media to not only to propagandize the continuation of business as usual, and it really is business as usual, uh, but they also uh, are very actively using the media to, if you like, deny or to oppose the use of media that would inform and educate the population so that the population could right. mobilize more effectively. Right. It's a fascinating environment, and I'm sure for someone in sociology with a connection to media, you must spend some time thinking about these kinds of challenges. Yeah. Well, the media um, has played a very bad role in this scenario right now. Um, remember, media in the United States are all corporate at this point. I mean, even public radio is basically funded largely by corporate mm. funds, not just membership drives. So, um, and the large corporate donors to the Republican Party, the Koch brothers and so forth, play a huge role in this. I mean, because we have a conservative media world with Fox and so forth that plays you know, a huge role in this. Um, you and I were talking just before we went on air here about my concerns about the, the liberal media like MSNBC and um, CNN and so forth, which are very you know, dogged in pursuing Trump but have done a kind of public disservice, I think, in the way they're challenging Trump, which is to say they're, they're entirely focusing on the investigation, which is important, the invest all the multiple investigations of his mob, like Godfather or Goodfellas sort of uh, uh, way of running the presidency. But what's being left out of this conversation, in, you're, you're talking about, I mean, in an era of extinction, you would think that every day the media would be having a segment that yes. is totally focused on, because we, we, what do we have, maybe 10, 12 years, the UN is now saying, to bring carbon emissions down to virtually, and that's an optimistic view, mm. uh, down to a net, you know, zero emissions of uh, carbon. And this, we're not even talking about nuclear war things that have been progressing, which the public has, and the media have largely completely ignored, um, until maybe very recently, but it's still very marginal. So the anti-Trump media, has done us a disservice because it's not only the conservative media denying climate change and celebrating Trump's nuclear policy, but the liberal media is simply ignoring it. You don't, if you turn on Rachel Maddow, for example, um, or people of this ilk who are very smart and very progressive, you won't hear them say a word about mm. extinction. I haven't, mm. I mean, I watch this, this programming regularly, mm. like many people, and um, in this focus on the investigations, they've blotted out, and by the way, the investigations have all been sort of driven from the conservative notion that the problem with Trump is that he doesn't respect our FBI, CIA, and Pentagon, the adult, who are the adults <laughs> in the uh, MSNBC studios? They're people who have been running the war in Iraq and the people who have been architects of the old Cold War and now the new Cold War. So that in a funny way, the media, with all good liberal intentions, has been ironically perpetuating both an extinction denialism and also intensifying a kind of militarized view of um, 
why Russia and other great enemies of the United States are being, Trump is somehow running a massive appeasement campaign and that that's the problem with Trump in some way. So the media is really playing an important role in uh, perpetuating the kind of extinction crisis and denial that we're mm -hmm. dealing with. And it seems to me that one of the great contributions that that kind of thinking or that way of seeing things uh, really offers to us who might be in more multidisciplinary areas such as yes. media and communication is that sociology has a very clear approach to understanding structures and how structures operate and the media has very clearly a structure. That's right. And within, and I know we've talked about this before, I've done a lot of work around political economy and the whole idea of what the political economy actually is seems to me to be in the US and I guess just generally right across the globe with few exceptions about a media that seeks, for, as you said, not to ask questions that are essential to human survival or to the survival of the planet, but that is incredibly dedicated to the continuation of consum consumerism or consumption. Yes. That, that to ask the really serious questions about how we live in the everyday is to then to have to ask the sociological question about the structure. Right. Yeah. So the media world, as I said before, has become part of the large corp, global corp, corp you know, mm. capitalist corporate system. Every major media is corp, is owned by corporations, and and yet there's just enough ability to raise certain kinds of questions that um, I mean, if you live in a purely propagandized society where you have state media like under. Stalinism or under, you know, sort of Big Brother Orwellianism, um, it becomes easy for the public to recognize that the media is playing a certain propagandistic role. In the United States, when you have, say, you know, channels like CNN and MSNBC clearly challenging the president, people are more persuaded that somehow we have an open and free media and people can say whatever they please and that therefore you have a media that's opening up a democratic conversation. Well, it's true that we have a certain measure of, of freedom in the United States to express dissident ideas. Mm. I mean, people like Chomsky or like myself who are very critical and write books about these critical issues, we're not killed. And we, you know, that we can get mm. death threats, but we survive. The state hasn't taken us down, mm. although there's enormous amounts of repression. Um, but the media is hard to critique. The structural basis of media is subtle, right? Because there are these critiques. So you look at them, if you look at MSNBC and you watch people who are railing against Trump, you think, wow, we live in this world of um, mass mobilized um, media. And yet, the nature of that media, and again, the anti-Trump movement is such a powerful example of this. The anti-Trump media is being mm -hmm. driven uh, being led by Bush, Pentagon, neoconservative critics like Bill Kristol, or you know, um, it's 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 a sign of how deeply embedded in our culture and the media plays a big role. Um, the sort of sense of America as a country, an exceptionalist nation that in our global, you know, um, militarized capitalist world is defending the world. The, you know, always saying the head of the free world, mm -hmm. and it becomes impossible to to view American wars as not just mistakes, which is the way they're usually characterized, mm -hmm. or, um, but as criminal, which, you know, in the context of extinction, in yeah. the context of the actual nature of these wars, they should be understood as criminal enterprises. And um, there's nobody in the media who really treats them this way. And um, yeah, so there, there's just a lot to say about how the media is very difficult to understand in this country because the structural realities of its corporate character and the elements of freedom and dissent that are permitted on the media make it much more difficult to understand what the constraints of the media world are and how they right. perpetuate, for example, the incredible insanity of the, the, the failure to address the extinction crisis, which is mm. obviously the most important crisis human yeah. beings have yeah. ever faced. Mm. And yet, how much do you see on the media about it? Not very much. Now, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Green New Deal conversation that's just beginning um, right. as we're talking today, um, is opening up a little space in Washington for this conversation. The media will pay a little attention to it, but my guess is they'll go back primarily to the focus on the investigation and not spend very much time on it. Do you think someone like Alexandria Octavia Cortez or, or people, younger people in this 
movement that associated with the New Green Deal and ev I think it's Evergreen and so on. Yeah. You know, what used to be, well, I, suppose, I suppose they're still millennials and Generation, Generation X, Z, Z now. Z, yeah, yeah, right. Z. Uh, we're going to run out of the alphabet soon <laughs> enough. Uh, but what happens, what, ha what, what that seems to suggest is a whole new media environment, mm. right? The new media, social media, Twitter, uh, and um, Facebook, and groups organizing in different ways that, s that might, might suggest alternative uh, structures of yeah. engagement and uh, Well, social know, media is such a complex issue. Um, you know, there's a good deal of literature about it which suggests that um, people are, I mean, I notice with students, anybody who's on the campuses notices that people, college students are on their phones all the time, right? Yes. And it's, yeah. um, and even when they're walking down the campus with each other, they're not talking to each other, they're talking to people, they're, they're you know, scanning through their texts and so forth. Um, so it's a very, con another contradictory thing because on the one way, in a one way I've seen young people mobilized through social media. People like Cortez, for example, is really clever and mm. charismatic mm. in the way she uses, um, you know, Facebook and, I mean, Twitter and all that stuff. She, and it's a very powerful way to communicate and mobilize. On the other hand, it's a very atomizing experience. You know, people who have like 3,000 friends on Facebook may have almost no friends. In fact, there have been a lot of studies um, by people who study social media which suggest the more people spend on Facebook, the more time they're looking at how many people are liking their shares or sharing their, their posts, mm -hmm. but are really atomized and isolated. So you could say that this is kind of a technology that global corporate forces are very happy to see develop because it's atomizing people in ways that are actually, I mean, the degree of loneliness, isolation, mm -hmm. as people are constantly on their, you know, social media is is intensifying I think yeah. so but it is contradictory because it's also a very powerful way the, the young people's movements for mm -hmm. against say climate and war and so forth are can be I've, I've been amazed by how powerfully young people can use these technologies to rapidly bring movements out into the open and move protests very quickly into large-scale social action and social protests as happened with the women's movement right after you know, Trump yeah, got Trump's inaugurated and so yeah, forth. Yeah. Right. yeah, So it's another contradictory force. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, I suppose those of us who are schooled in and care about dialectics would see that as uh, <laughs> something potentially quite valuable. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we don't know where where these things end up. No, uh, I don't when, think when, do. when when uh, the potential for quite dramatic explosive action. Uh, is is deeply embedded in those technologies, even though they're and, thoroughly, and you know, thoroughly capitalistic. Yeah. And they're really, I mean, I think they're really generationally harnessed right now so that you've got young people so deeply immersed in this technology and we don't know how it's going to play out. And if we return to this threat of extinction, I mean, it, these are the people whose lives are truly um, going to be impacted in the most profound way. And it raises this question of whether this generation is being mobilized to confront it. My own per position on this, since I'm also, I went into sociology not because of sociology as a discipline, but because mm -hmm. it's the one discipline that actually allows you to be interdisciplinary. So I knew <laughs> that I wanted to deal with big issues that can only be understood economically, historically, politically. You couldn't, you know, universities are doing a disservice because they've carved up knowledge into these, as if these disciplines should be understood as in different buildings and different spheres yeah. of thinking and so forth, mm. but they, you can't be, um, think about war and peace or, you know, the economic systems of global capitalism without being a historian, an economist, a political science mm. Mm. and so forth. So I think that I went into this field so I could legitimate, you know, it's the one field that allows you to right. sort of do all this different stuff. And so um, I'm thinking that extinction has become the overwhelming imperative of the day to intellectually crash through right. all of the disciplinary barriers for dealing with it. And it's young people who are going to have to take the lead on this. Mm. And whether the universities and the media and so forth are, is a cultural and political um, transformation. But it also involves understanding, I mean, one, you're right that sociology puts a lot of attention, in, like, like political economy, on institutional structures, particularly economic structures, and deep un in the substructure of the extinction crisis is capitalism itself, because mm. capitalism drives mass consumption, mass profit-driven war, and climate change, actually. I mean, if you look carefully, 
I have a little triangle of extinction, which I should have brought it a little uh, visual in, with capitalism at the top, climate change on one side, and militarism and war on the other. And I simply think if you're going to deal with the, the crisis, the overwhelming, I want to can't say enough, we are living in a period that people have never, ever confronted mm -hmm. before, which is the end of human civilization. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is right at the heart of that crisis. It's not just a matter of reducing emissions. It's a, it's a matter of dealing with all kinds of extraction of resources, destruction of the environment, consumerism of all kinds. It, it's our whole way of life, the whole way our whole economic system works, mm -hmm. which is driving both climate change and war. And climate change and war drive each other in various ways. Sure. The Pentagon is the biggest emitter of um, you know, fossil fuels. Climate change is, the Pentagon itself has said that climate change is the biggest national security challenge. So, but this is all being repressed because the overall system of our economy doesn't, because the media is, is, and almost all mm -hmm. intellectual and cultural forces are being driven by these profit engines which don't really, education, media, um, unions and other organizations on the ground that might bring people up. Are, are being repressed by a lack of access to mass media for this stuff. So sure. it, it's, it's tragic. Um, I do think there's some hope that these young, this new wave of the young Democratic Party in the contour, are pro progressive social movement people are coming off the, you know, yeah. I love the fact that Alexandria and these people who are Congress people moved into their leadership office and sat in and actually said, we need to talk about climate change and war and so forth because the leadership of the party is not there yet. And so um, there's some possibilities. And it does, it does seem like there's some echoes of the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. I wasn't active, I wasn't really very old in, in the 1960s when the movement, the moratoriums and the movements against conscription and so on were really a mobilization of young people against conscription, against what the government yeah. was doing and brought about yeah. real change. And, that, and it seems to me that we, what we perhaps don't have a hear much of in, in uh, at least my field, media studies and cultural studies, is indeed the crisis, or the, this language, the, the use of a lang language about a crisis. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder how long it'll take, or at least maybe it'll never happen, that uh, well, the, you know, the, full discussion. The, the, the elites have been very sophisticated in learning how to keep young people relatively demobilized and quiet. The most important thing they did was remove the draft because they realized, um, for example, where both of us are rooted at Boston College in the, about 1970, the school was highly mobilized against the war in Vietnam. There was enormous peace mm. activism. Mm. How big is the peace movement today? There's hardly a visible peace movement no, in the no. United States. There are a lot of local and important, you know, there, there are all kinds of feminist act peace movements and so forth, but it's, it's minimal and so forth. So, and that, I think that reflects the fact that the, the um, sort of economic, putting people in economic fear um, regarding student debt and job insecurity and so forth, making wars seem very distant because people who are privileged yeah. don't have to go worry about yeah. being killed mm -hmm. ever somewhere else. And also producing, you know, enemies at home and abroad that for large numbers of people keep people focused on um, the enemy rather than the elites that are driving this whole mm -hmm. system, right? right. I, I was mentioning to you earlier that I think of capitalism as an upstairs, downstairs house. And the, the great chronic crisis of capitalism is how to keep the downstairs from <coughs> removing the people on the upstairs. Well, there's an easy answer to that. You say that there are people out there, enemies, who want to blow the house, whole house up, so you blow the house down. So you have to basically, the, uh, the people on the downstairs who are working people who are not doing well, come to feel tied to the people on upstairs who are protecting them. And, um, and then there are also people allied with those terrible people who are immigrants coming in out, so, you know, you know, mm. over our border or are terrorists from outside who are you know, liberals and uh, academics and people like you and me who are also seen as allied to those enemies. And the working classes and the elites come together. So mm. you get this irony that Marx said that you know, capitalists would, capitalism would go into crisis, which it certainly has. And he said that it was going to mobilize the downstairs workers against, and in fact, what it has, it's created an alliance between the capitalists upstairs and the workers downstairs <laughs> against 
a very different you know opposition which is all these constructed enemies abroad yeah. and at home yeah. who are mostly people of color immigrants and liberals and socialists and so forth who are the yes. new enemy again and um, the new Cold War that ironically the liberal media is in some way promoting so um, if you realize that the extinction crisis is really a crisis of the way we're thinking about how our whole economic political economy is operating, the way our capitalist system is operating, the way our media is a reflection yeah. of that system, the way in which our educational system has become corporatized, um, and the way in which climate change and war are in some way expressions of the overall uh, sort of structures that got, dominate our life, you realize we need a mass crash educational program for the population. The media and the university should be playing that role. Um, it's really going to come, I think, from on the streets and from people who are beginning to mobilize now so that the, um, you know, a sort of united front of progressive um, Democrats who can speak to, with, and to people on the ground in their communities who are organizing and they're uh, with the young people is the Sunrise Movement, which is sort of the local movement, which is saying in mm. three weeks, if we don't see movement on extinction, we are going to occupy every, I don't know if you read about this, no, but um, no. yeah, they say we're going to occupy every office in Washington oh, until they right? start paying attention. So yeah. in two weeks and from so, yeah, two weeks. and they're talking about, for example, there are extinction movements. There's in England, there's an extinction, something called the Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, yeah. There's a movement in the United States that's um, called Earth Strike that's going to do a, a general strike in the United States in September to shut yeah. down the American time. Say, as long as extinction is bearing down on us, yeah. we can't go about business as usual. We're going to shut it down. So I think that that probably is testament to the fact that the crisis has reached a threshold. Yeah. Even though the crisis is not present. There's no enunciation, as it were. Yeah. We're beginning to see the emergence of a conversation. Yes. And yes. Um, that's progress. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the, the possibility that there might be a connection between the mobilization of younger people using new forms of media and uh, taking action. Yeah. Uh, when there's been what seems to have been a fair bit of lethargy or inaction for a long time. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think you've made some very helpful points, particularly to, to help us think about the the structures of, uh, of organization that have been involved in making, uh, as you put it, the upstairs uh, <laughs> stay, stay safe. Stay safe, yeah. And, and, and you know, the left has played a role in this just very quickly because it's been fragmented into identity movements around race and culture and it's sort of left behind stories about capitalism and about mm. militarism and that's why we have movements that are pretty strong about gender and race and these movements are important but they can't operate without mm. understanding the context of the larger economic and political systems and so I think the Green New Deal and the move the rise of a new conversation about capitalism and socialism that Bernie Sanders and people, Elizabeth Warren and other Democrats along with movements just now beginning to say yeah these race and gender movements which are so profoundly important have to understand their own connection with with the economic framework of the world and the um, so so I think we might be at the threshold of a turn again right. good let's hope well yes yeah, let's let's <laughs> hope uh, we don't want to be too dismal and <laughs> uh, right. we, we, we do want to have uh, some optimism as to uh, what not only we can experience but also what younger generations can pull together and, right. and make of the world right. and of course not only younger generations uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren yeah both from our region here from Massachusetts or in Vermont uh, have made significant contributions to informing the population and taking good uh, control if you like of some of the messaging yeah. as they say and I do think that the young people are be this is becoming the climate issues are becoming mainstream um, and um, I teach courses on peace where people are really receptive and hungry to hear about this and its relation to the economy. So I think we may be at the beginning of a turn here. And um, so I'm, I mean, the message I spend every day with a lot of young people, I feel a certain measure of hope about this, yeah. Well, that's a great point on which to finish, Charlie. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for uh, being thanks, here. Thanks for having and me. And thank Marcus. you for yeah. uh, drawing this to our attention, particularly uh, that uh, lovely uh, sense of there uh, being a point at which we're at the turn, <laughs> uh, a turn of optimism and a turn right. of uh, hope. Uh, so thank you very much again. Uh, and that's it from me and that's it for uh, another episode of Boston Media Theory. So from me, Marcus Breen, uh, goodbye and keep on mediating.